So we're going to, um, over the next several weeks, um, we're going to do kind of a mini sub-series within Acts, um, specifically on the scriptures. If you were here a year ago, we did something similar to that, but since most of you in this room were not here a year ago, we can do this again, and none of you would know. We're going to go uh, specifically in what are the scriptures. Um, I want to tackle a few things, what our posture to the scriptures should be, techniques for it. The reason I want to do this is because I think we can just miss how profound this verse is. They were eager, examining the scriptures every single day. Why? What made them eager? A quick thought experiment before we start. Feel free to close your eyes. I'm actually gonna ask that you do that. It'd be a little weird if you're just like staring at me during this, but just close your eyes for a second. I wanna ask you a simple question around your relationship with the Bible. What comes to mind? What difficulties do you face when it comes to the Bible? Fears, confusion, boredom, skepticism. What comes to mind with your relationship to the Bible? anxieties do you feel? Questions you have? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Just be honest. You can open them. I'll be honest. The Bible is full of weird stuff. I'm just curious, and this is not a shaming question, I'm just curious, how many of you have read the whole thing all the way through? Okay, yeah, that's great, yeah. So we're about halfway through year one of our church-wide Bible reading plan. We start back in September, and so far, we have seen stories like Ruth. What the heck is she doing laying at this old man's feet? What the heck is Leviticus about? And who is Cain's wife? Some weird stuff in this. It's also full of some pretty horrible things as well, like sexual assault, genocide, holy war, polygamy. This book, or really the library of books is tough. So where on earth do we start with a mini-series about the scriptures? Well, we could kind of start by putting the Bible on trial. We could ask it a bunch of questions. We could demand it to give us answers to prove itself. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. I, I trust the scriptures. It doesn't seem to be that threatened with my doubts or my questions. I think a lot of you do need to go through that process. C.S. Lewis is a great example of one who went through that process and ended up following Jesus. So that does happen. But what I have seen a lot in my own heart, and I think in a lot of Christians, if you're honest, is that we think largely about the Bible with our minds. We stand kind of arm's length away from it. We're like ready to defend it to the death. But we don't really look like Jesus. I think in a lot of ways, we become maybe more unloving and less patient and less kind. When my theological paradigm does not match up with yours, I have to fix you (laughs) or fight you. I was uh, looking up the state of the Bible, just among like the generations. And what was really interesting, specifically among Gen Z youth, so that's like 15 years old to 17 years old, only one third of them like read the scriptures regularly. It gets a little bit higher as the generations get older, but only one third of them would say, yes, I, I I read the scriptures. By and large, the just dominating like thought process about the Bible is we don't really get the relevance of this thing in our life. 
I would argue probably similarly with millennials too, just from the data, but the posture itself is one of critique. They appreciate it more as literature, but not necessarily as scripture. I also found this interesting. They are of the loneliest generation, by far reporting the highest stress and trauma and lowest hope of any generation in America. And so some of you may be tempted to say, well, see, that's why we gotta read the Bible. That's why the country's going to heck. I don't know if I can say the other word in that context. Maybe I can. I don't know. I'm still working through that. But But I also found this interesting. Five things that Gen Z is frustrated about with Christians. Number one, when partisan politics reshape faith. Number two, when apologetics or arguing the Bible outweighs relationships. This is a big one. When Christians don't live what they believe. When Christians are known more for judgment than agape, love. When Christians just aren't serious thinkers. (laughs) Here's my point. The goal is not to shame older Christians or suggest by any means that us like younger folk are enlightened. The goal is simply this. Our posture towards the scriptures, be it one of critique or one of just radical defense, our posture towards the scripture matters so much more than technique. That's why I wanna start here with posture, with approach to the scriptures. Whether we come at it from critic, as a critic or a defender, we need to approach it more with our hearts than our heads. More than formation rather than just information. We may be able to defend the scriptures to the death, but we struggle to let it change us and spill out in love and service to others, or as Jesus would say, put his teachings into practice. But I am convinced this is how the tide shifts, is when we start reading it more for being formed by it than informed. I don't wanna start with just all the problems of the Bible, or really even the Bible itself, but with Jesus. How did he think about the scriptures? What was his approach? When I've come at it more from a posture of, sum, of surrender or humility or discipleship, my heart has actually started to change. I've really come to trust the Bible more that way. I love how Andrew Wilson says this. I don't trust in Jesus because I trust the Bible. I trust the Bible because I trust in Jesus. I love him. I've decided to follow him. So if he talks and acts as if the Bible is trustworthy and authoritative and good and helpful and powerful, then I will too. Even if some of my questions remain unanswered or my answers remain unpopular. So let's start there. How did Jesus think about the scriptures? Well, Jesus was a rabbi which means he was a teacher. A teacher of what? Crowd? The scriptures, very good. The Bible of his day. As a rabbi, he would have committed it to memory. Even Leviticus, he would have committed the like whole Bible of his day to memory. We say we have a, like a high view of scripture a lot around here. Jesus is like way higher. He loved the scriptures. He fought the devil with the scriptures. His entire worldview was on how the world works and how it worked was based on that. He said not a single dot in the Hebrew language would be unfulfilled by him. So according to Jesus, there is no legitimate discipleship to him without the Bible. Whatever your relationship is with it, There is no legitimate discipleship to him without the Bible. Look at what he says in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. That's the Bible of his day. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. That word there for abolish, it is Greek for literally, it means to like tear down or destroy. 
or to disobey or to change or in maybe language we would understand today to deconstruct from. So this is wild. Apparently, Jesus's life and teaching was so radical, his like outworking of the scriptures, that people actually thought he was tearing down the Bible. That is how far they had gotten away from knowing what the Bible was. What a word for us today. They have completely just like forgotten what the scriptures were about. He says, I've come to fulfill them. What that means is that for Jesus, all of Old Testament prophecy would come to pass in and through him. The scriptures of his day, the entire story itself was leading up to him. Isn't that amazing? He says, for truly I tell you until heaven and earth disappear, Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least. That word there for set aside, it's similar to deconstruct or change. Also another word for it is like untie, like a shoelace to play fast and loose with the scriptures. So this is like picking and choosing what you like in the Bible and ignoring the other stuff. This is saying things that have been orthodox forever and then saying, but does it really say that? Things that are so difficult, playing fast and loose. If he says, if you do this, you teach others to do this. So saying you don't need to obey all this, we can just accommodate the scriptures to our city and to our time and to our culture. You will be called least in the kingdom of God. But if you practice, we love that word, If you practice, if you hear the word and you do something about it, you take it incredibly seriously. You don't relax it, deconstruct it. He says, you will be called great in the kingdom of God. Jesus' view is so incredibly high about what the scriptures are and how they play and our experience in the kingdom with how we treat it. Verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a little dig there for the Pharisees and teachers of the law. We'll get there in a second. But what Jesus does then is he starts walking through the Bible. For the next few chapters, he says, you've heard it said before, but I tell you. He's just going through passages in the scriptures And he's saying, he's calling out even interpretations that the teachers of the law had in the day. He says, listen, this is not even just about right interpretation. Whether you've got it right or not, your heart towards the scriptures is completely off. It seems that Jesus is not only calling into question ways that people were reading the Bible of that day, but also of our day. What are those? Well, there's two dominating hermeneutics or ways of reading the scripture. There's one that's called like the ordinary human text. You maybe heard of this called like a progressive reading. The other is, I love this, the golden tablets from heaven view, which is like a fundamentalist like kind of reading of the scriptures. The ordinary text sees the scriptures as full of error, contradiction, even dangerous ideas perpetuating tribalism, homophobia, misogyny, patriarchy, capital punishment. In this hermeneutic, the scriptures, they may be appreciated, but largely as a human document. We don't really know how this was put together. Wasn't it like only dudes that put this together? And yeah, it's like got cool experiences of God, which is good for them. So, I mean, you can give it a read every now and then. This way appreciates the Bible, but largely as literature, not as scripture. 
It's sensitive to that. I also think this is a reaction to maybe a more fundamentalist read where the Bible was just kind of dropped out of heaven. Human beings were not really involved with it. This is the view that promotes don't ask questions. (laughs) Fall in line. Very face value reading. It's super easy to understand. It's crystal clear. Don't worry about all the kind of weird genocide stuff. Like, it's really clear to understand. God says it. I believe it. That settles it. We heard that before? I think this view tends to elevate the divine part of the Bible, but it like diminishes the humanness of it. Almost like human partnership with the Bible is like dirty. It's hard to get behind. It's hard to see scripture as literature. It's hard to see that there are a lot of different people that were writing this, influenced and inspired by God in different contexts. It's hard to get behind that, I think, in this camp. And listen, this isn't a perfect correlation, but there's a lot of similarities to the way that other people in Jesus' day were reading the Bible. Two major camps, two major like hermeneutical camps in Jesus' day were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So the Sadducees, we would say they come at it more from a posture of critique. This was like upper elite intellectual class, like South End and Plaza. (laughs) Power brokers of the day, they were buddy-buddy with Rome. They were fast and loose with the Bible. They didn't really see anything beyond the first five books as scripture. And even the Torah itself is up for some changes. Demons, angels, resurrection, like none of that's true. They were way more willing to accommodate the Bible to the Roman view of the good life. This is how Jesus talks to them in Matthew 12. So the Sadducees that, who say there is no resurrection, they came to him with a question. This is like the mother load of all hypotheticals here. <laughs> they say, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a a wife without a child, that man must marry the widow and raise up his offspring for his brother. Now, again, scripture, it's a cross-cultural experience. This actually was a very beautiful law. In the ancient Near East, women were just thrown aside if this would have happened to them. So this is a way to protect women in this, again, cross-cultural lens when we come to the Bible. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without having any children. And the second one married the widow. He also died, leaving no kids. And this happened with the third. In fact, all seven brothers died, leaving no kids. The mother of hypotheticals. Oh, and then also the woman dies too. (laughs) At the resurrection, Jesus, whose wife will she be? since the seven were married to her. This is funny, but hear the contempt in this. The scriptures are foolishness. And so we wanna trap you. We wanna like come at it more from an intellectual understanding and just like start to pick it apart. There's a ton of contempt in how people approach the scriptures. Look at what Jesus says here. Are you not in error? Because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels. Now about the dead rising, have you not read the book of Moses? He's saying, have you not read the Bible? In the account of the burning bush, how God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He's not a God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. He's honest. He's concerned with him. He's just straight up saying, guys, you don't even know what is in the Bible. 
You make judgments for which you have no knowledge or understanding about. Your views of the good life, sexuality, how to use your time, what makes you money, it has been hijacked by TikTok and not by the scriptures. And you are badly mistaken. Is that you today? Is your posture towards the scriptures one of contempt and critique? Do you really even know what is in this thing? If you don't, you are badly mistaken. The other group were called the Pharisees. So this is like the conservative kind of group of the people. I found this really interesting. They were predominantly in the rural, small town parts of Israel. So like Rock Hill and Gaston County. That joke's going to get old. But they were incredibly devoted to the scriptures. We'll give them that. A lot of them would have had their kids memorize the whole Old Testament by the fifth grade. This was really interesting. Scholars say what the Pharisees would do, because their posture was one of defense, what they would do is they would fence the scriptures. What that means is that they would add these laws, these like human traditions around a law. So they didn't even want you to get close to breaking the like real law. If you broke the other stuff, that was bad, we'd stop you there so that you couldn't break the other thing. Incredible like defense around the scriptures. But hear this challenge from Jesus to the Pharisees in John 5. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You love the Bible, but you don't love me. This is the tradition that sees the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. (laughs) You love the Bible, but you don't love me. You don't know the power of God. You study the scriptures diligently. (laughs) He says in verse 41, I do not accept the glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you don't have the love of God in your hearts. (sighs) You love the Bible so much, but you don't love others. You're so sure in your convictions, in your morality, in your doctrine but you are so harsh towards others who have questions. You spend hours in Bible commentaries, but little in prayer. You can recite Calvin's Institutes, but you do little to care for the marginalized in your community. He says, don't think I've come to accuse you. Your accuser is the Bible itself on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote about me. You study the scriptures, great, but all for the wrong reasons. You have lost sight of the fact that the scriptures themselves are not the end goal, it's Jesus. To be with him, to become like him, Is that you today? (laughs) You love the Bible with your head, but have you missed it? At some level, we could stop here. Just say, don't be a Pharisee (laughs) or a Sadducee. Don't be a critic or a defender but I do still think we're talking largely about technique here. I think we need to go a layer deeper. 
not just thinking about the Bible with our minds, but approaching them with our hearts. We need to actually work through what the role of the Bible is in our discipleship to Jesus. What is it for? How should we approach the Bible? Turn to 2 Timothy 3. We'll start in verse 14. So if you were here a few weeks ago, we walked through a biography of Timothy. Uh, You can go back and listen to that if you want. But largely what Paul is saying to Timothy here is, hey, remember these things from your youth, your grandma and your mom, who like imparted these things on on you. He says, but as for you, continue in what you learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from which you learned it. Again, talking about mom and grandma here. How from infancy, you've known the scriptures, which are able to make you wise. That word wise there, it's both intelligence, but it's also goodness. So skillful and smart, wise and good at living. So to make you wise, but for salvation through faith in Jesus. So it is for those things, but it is for the healing of your soul through trust in Jesus. All scripture, this is a popular one. All scripture is God breathed. We'll talk about that later on in the weeks. What is inspiration? Literally breathed out by God. And it's useful for these things. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. So teaching, it's to reveal to us a whole new possibility of what the good life in the kingdom could look like. This is like what it could be if we were to live lives like this. It's to counteract the lies of the devil, the flesh, the world. It's also for rebuking to show us all the ways that we are not walking in the good life. Ways that we are out of alignment with that. But it doesn't stop there, it's correcting. It then shows us how to get back into alignment with that, how to come under the discipleship of Jesus and training. This word for training, this was a popular word used in the Greco-Roman world. Largely what it means is from like infancy to adulthood. All of the things All of the combination of things, education, structure, practices, mentorship, all of that played a part in formation. So here's the thing. There is something about the regular reading of scripture that will nurture and grow our soul. It will form us into the kind of humans we were originally made to be. Verse 17, it shows the scriptures has an agenda for your life. So the servant of God, not just a reader, not a critic or a scholar or a defender, but one who what? Wants to serve God. They may be complete. Thoroughly equipped is used there, but a better translation is they may be complete. The Greek word there for complete, it means the like ideal example of something. One scholar says it's like perfectly suited to its nature. This is what's so interesting to me about the debate around like LeBron and Michael Jordan. The fact that that in and of itself is a conversation means that there is an ideal specimen of a basketball player that we then look at all other basketball players based on him. He is like the telos of all basketball players. I did this recently when I was going um, to try this new like chicken place near my house. It was okay. It was a little dry. Um, the sauces were good, but it's kind of beyond that. But it's what's interesting, and in my heart, the, like, first thing I thought of, my first, like, way that I connected the dots is, like, this this really isn't (laughs) Chick-fil-A. The end goal of all chicken is (laughs) Chick-fil-A. It's the goat, man, just, that's right. 
the end goal, the telos, through teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training, is to nurture us to become the best version of all human beings have the potential to become through wholeness in Jesus. Complete. To have this happen to your soul, to form you into this kind of person, it takes more than just technique. It's more than just finding good Bible study commentaries and tools. It's not less than that, but it is more. It requires reading with a posture, a right posture of the heart. And this is so hard for us in the West because we have been trained and conditioned to read things for information and not for formation. When we approach books and blogs and news, like we're just reading to get knowledge, to have better control over our lives and the lives of others. We aren't reading to be formed by it, but to co-opt it, to use it. You've heard it been said before, knowledge is power. What's interesting is this the exact opposite disposition Jesus calls us with the Bible. We don't approach scriptures to get more knowledge and control, but to give up our control and to follow in the way of the cross. We read the Bible to be formed, not informed. Informational reading, it is about reading as much as possible, as quickly as possible to get what you need out of it and move on. That's why we read like maybe four sentences from a blog post. We just like speed through that thing. Formational reading though, it is about quality, not quantity. To slow down, to sit with the text, to wait for God, to partner with the Spirit, to struggle with God, to wrestle with God. We don't like that. <laughs> to ask questions to God and to meet and commune with him or simply to be with him. When was the last time you came to the scriptures just to, I just wanna be with you? Informational reading is to master the text, to get our heads around it, to control it for our purposes and our agenda, but formational reading is to be mastered by God through the text, to be changed by it, to be used and controlled for our good by the Spirit and for the purposes of God. Guys, informational reading, it's not bad. I don't wanna paint a picture that way. There's a time and place for that, especially in study. But I would argue this is primarily our approach with the scriptures here in the West. And we need a deep shift in posture when we come to the text. Robert Mahoney says, to be conformed by something else outside your control it goes totally and radically against the ingrained perspective of our culture. Graspers, they powerfully resist being grasped by God. Manipulators, they strongly reject being shaped by God. Controllers are inherently incapable of yielding control to God. Information takers have extreme difficulty just hearing God's voice. Functionally oriented people have great problems with just sitting still and letting God act. Anybody out there? Performance oriented persons, they have powerful temptation to turn spirituality into works. But spiritual formation is the great reversal from acting to being acted upon, 
from being the subject who controls to being a person who is shaped by God. I love another way this was put. It is a shift from being our own production to being simply God's creation. How are we doing? Listen, I I recognize this is tough. It's one thing to say, I want to follow Jesus, but still feel like you're the masters of your life. But I do think this is what Jesus meant by denying yourself and taking up a cross and following him. It's a slow death from controlling to releasing. The scriptures, and I would just say, when it comes to even our posture of coming to Jesus ourselves, it is one of this like yieldedness. Here I am. It doesn't stop with you just becoming a Christian, but it does start there. And maybe some of you are not there. This innate, like, egocentric sense of control that is at the heart of what is wrong with all of us. What is killing you is you. The original sin, what was so interesting about that is we wanted to grasp and take from what? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. But our deep fear was, does God actually know what is good and evil? And is he wise enough to be able to impart that on us? You see that? That posture. That's why the scriptures say salvation is this gift so that no one can boast because it's not what you bring, but it's what's done for you and to you. As are the scriptures. I must be honest, coming at the scriptures from this posture is it's hard. Scripture calls itself a double-edged sword because it feels like a cutting. I do think sometimes we can read the scriptures and just completely forsake God's voice because we know that if we're still enough, he wants to do something in us, but we're afraid. I read this uh, a year or two ago. I think it's one of my favorite analogies from C.S. Lewis's book, Don Treader. It's a, about a boy who becomes a dragon, essentially. It's this manifest evil of what was within his own soul. And it has made him now this dragon, and he doesn't want to be a dragon. And so he starts like clawing off the scales, and some of it's coming off, but it just kind of grows back. He can't change himself. And this is him reflecting on that, the very, the very first tear from the lion. The lion is this figure of, of God in the story. The very first tear, he made it was so deep. I thought it had gone like right into my heart. When he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I'd ever felt. But the only thing that made me able to bear it was just the sheer pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. He said, I was just lying there in the grass. But the stuff came off so much thicker and darker. And eventually then I was smooth. And he threw me into the water and it hurt like anything, but only for a moment because after that, As I started swimming and splashing around, I saw all the pain go away, and then I saw why I had turned back to a boy. I think this is the posture. We resist. It's just in us. Maybe I can, like, fix it. Maybe I can get enough things. But Jesus' simple invitation is, will you let me claw this stuff out of you? Will you yield? 
Because I would argue a mark of a follower of Jesus is an ultimate posture of yielding to the Spirit's work in us, which really is at the heart of confession and repentance. God, I agree with you. My sin is an affront to you. It's the exact opposite of your desire for me. So I ask you forgive and I come under the rule and reign of Jesus and I yield to you and I come under your reign into the kingdom of God. And so I ask again, what is our posture to the scriptures? What is your posture to Jesus? It has to be, I'm here. Come Holy Spirit. I'm simply here to just be with you and for you to do whatever you want in me. So I'll leave you with this, just two kind of simple practices for this week. One, I just ask whether you are a Christian or not, just find some alone time and just ask God and ask him these questions. Help me clarify, what is my relationship to the Bible? What do I think about this? What are my fears with it? What is my posture to it? Ultimately, that is the tell, telling of what is your posture to Jesus. Just be honest there. It's okay if there's not a lot there. That's a starting place. Number two, if you're not in the scriptures, consider jumping in with us. We have a plan that we're doing as a church. You can find it on the app. If you're new to the Bible, we've got some other plans that you can engage before you jump in. Just some simple plans around who Jesus is. No pressure either way. Again, in the words of Peloton, all of this is suggestions. You make decisions. <laughs> but I just would say, if you, if you will give yourself to that, I promise when we read the scriptures to be formed, not informed, you start becoming like him. Father in heaven, I just, I confess I confess that we, wherever we are on this spectrum, would you change our posture and our hearts Surround your word. Asking questions is good. We need to do that. But Father, I just pray even in our asking, and even if we don't get answers, may we fall in love with you more because we're simply just showing up to be with you. Corporately, would you do in us a great work as we fall in love with the scriptures, as we journey to learn better techniques, creating more space and margin for the scriptures in our lives? God, would, would, would you meet us and form in us a deep love for you? I pray that in Christ's name. Amen.